Hi everyone, it's Sandra, and this is Peekaboo. Now, last time I really bulked up this bin with a lot of bedding. You can see there's still some leaves on top. And yes, I did move it outside. I wanted to bulk it up in preparation to move it outside. And this bin has spent uh, the last about 10 days outside. I'll put a chart up showing the high-low temperatures of our greenhouse over the past 10 days so that you can see the range of conditions these worms have experienced. And so I had to bulk up the bin because this bin was recently harvested, about 70% of the material taken out. And I was worried that um, the new material would dry out too quickly. So um, I had to put a lot of these this this bedding, these leaves and 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 whatnot on top here uh, to give this bin some holding power so that it wouldn't be susceptible to either the highs or the lows of the greenhouse because we're still in that really transitional uh, phase of spring. Now I did put this fast food container down with that has a plastic liner that would hold good moisture. So let's take a look under that and we see the worms are hiding under there. Worms love moisture. You know, talk, I mean, that's gotta be anaerobic, right? Hi everyone, it's Sandra and I'm interrupting this important video again to shed some light on the worm science behind worms and their oxygen. Basically what might be anaerobic when it comes to worms. Now I can't give you a definitive answer on how your food is anaerobic versus aerobic yet. Not to say that I won't do a deep dive into it, but I did find something really interesting about worms and their use of oxygen that I thought I would pass along in the middle of this video. And that is that, you know, worms, um, you know, you know that they can survive in a wide range of temperatures. Well, when they are at the colder extremes of temperatures, um, you know, near freezing, right up to about room temperature, you know, um, as temperatures warm, they consume more oxygen and they produce more car carbon dioxide. Uh, that is a necessary process of cellular respiration is the consumption of oxygen and the production of carbon dioxide. Worms don't have lungs like we do, so it is just diffused out of their body through the surface area of their skin. And so the longer they stay in an anaerobic state, meaning there isn't a fresh input of oxygen into the system, you can see that more carbon dioxide would build up. And of course, carbon dioxide is not life sustaining, it's the exact opposite. So it would eventually become lethal to worms. So worms, uh, the warmer they are, the more they need that flushing of gases. So the gas, what's called the gas exchange, the input of oxygen and the flushing out of the carbon dioxide. So everything up until about room temperature is sort of this steady as she goes. They, they produce more carbon dioxide and they consume more oxygen. And then at about 20 degrees Celsius to about 25 degrees Celsius, so that's, you know, like 68 degrees Fahrenheit to about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. It actually forms a plateau. And, you know, that goes along with a lot of the other plateaus I've talked about in my worm science videos, where, you know, worms, this is optimum for reproduction and feeding behaviors. And so they think the worms are adapted to that as being their optimum temperature range. So about room temperature, to about 25 degrees Celsius, which we've always said when somebody says, well, what temperatures are good for red wigglers? And this research was on red wigglers, by the way. We've always said, well, if you're comfortable, your worms are comfortable and bingo, there you go. Okay, so what happens above 25 degrees Celsius? Well, after this plateau where it's steady as she goes, the worms are consuming oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide at a steady level after about 25 degrees Celsius, it doesn't go up nice and slow in a linear fashion. It, it switches to a logarithmetic fashion. And a log is where it's like boom, 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 boom. That is, you know, where you've got a multiplicative factor where it's actually 
um, it's like a hurricane scale, that the difference between a one and a two isn't linear, it's a log. And so, um, same with earthquakes here on the West Coast, we know very much about those. So anyway, so from 25 degrees Celsius, that's about 77 degrees Fahrenheit, up until about um, 30 degrees Celsius or about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, it's like swooping up like that. The worms are uh, consuming a lot more oxygen and they are releasing a lot more carbon dioxide. So my takeaway for you as a worm farmer is if you have your worms in very warm conditions, that's above that 25 degrees Celsius, 77 degrees Fahrenheit, know that they are going to need more air circulation, more flushing to give them the input of oxygen and to take away the carbon dioxide that is building up. Remember, the microbes in the soil also produce carbon dioxide. They're alive. All the fauna of the soil, the, the pill bugs, everything produces carbon dioxide. So the warmer those temperatures, the more you're going to need gas exchange for those worms. The researchers think this is an adaptive response that these worms have that at very low temperatures, the researchers don't use the word hibernate, that's my wor word, but the, the worms basically consume so little oxygen at low temperatures that they don't need uh, that tremendous airflow. They could live like buried um, under some compressed castings. You know, remember I found them at the bottom of Gilligan really compressed. They could live in situations where you think, how are they getting air in this situation as long as the bedding temperature is on the cool side. Okay, so let's go back to the video and let's see what those worms are doing. Are they anaerobic? You decide. Well, it wasn't airtight. Look at them all. You know, that's where the feeding was. Not very deep. There, there they all are. Look at them all down there. Yeah, and and really good moisture. Like this, this is, this is, this is really good moisture. Okay, so now that I've done this little bit of an assessment and seen, um, seen the worm party that's going on, remember, oh, look at the worm party. Remember, this was the office paper that I just stacked right on top of the feeding. And uh, and the worms are, you know, obviously the office paper has caked, caked together. That, um, yeah, you see the office paper has just caked together. It was probably a mistake doing that, but you know, it's not a mistake. The worms are very forgiving. All right, so this bin has uh, been more susceptible to temperature swings. It was pampered indoors with a pretty steady temperature and now it's gone outside. So it's more of a wild thing. And so what I'm gonna do is I'll keep that over there as best I can. I'm just gonna try to stir this up and that will distribute moisture because I can tell right away the corners are a lot drier than what I just turned over in the middle. So we're just gonna do a bin stir. And then I'm going to feed these worms again. And uh, that is a, oh, that's an amaryllis leaf, I think. I was pruning my amaryllis. Yeah, you see it's much drier on the end here. So doing a binster will equalize the moisture. Those are the, these are the rose stems that I gave. Look at that. I'm going to take a while for them to, um, for them to get eaten. But uh, that's okay. So I'm just trying to. Yeah, that's will move the worms around. It'll move this new bedding around. Introduce some air pockets. Because, yeah, this um, this office paper, I'm just going to get my other hand dirty here. This office paper definitely is clumping. Unfortunately, there we go. Uh, it, the clumps bother humans. I can tell you right now, the clumps don't bother the worms. If, yeah, look at that. There are worms in the clumps. They don't care. They're in there. It's just us humans that go, ooh, we would be uncomfortable living in a clumpy home. The worms, not a problem. Okay, so I'll just split those up. So let's turn over this wet center where we had all those worms. 
There we go. I'm glad that the moisture was retained in this bin because, uh, you know, the, like I said, there was a lot of new bedding before I introduced all that leaves and whatnot on the top. Yeah, see the corners are drying out more than the middle. So this is good that I'm stirring it all up. There we go. Yeah, see this is a very dry corner. So good to get this dry material into the wet. Few of my gorgeous worms just hanging out here on this fast food container along with the roly-poly who's going to help us eat up these chunky bits here's an old liner from a takeout container that I will eventually pull out but in the meantime it'll help retain moisture I have a help thank you I have a helper bringing me the corn husks Oh, and there's a little bit of mango in there as well. Or papaya, I think. So I've got some tamale wrappers. Thank you, Micah. You're welcome. And some shrimp shells. Shrimp shells will be a great source of chitin. And... There is uh, food there, nourishment for the worms. It's not just chitin. So as uh, the moisture of this bin dissolves those shrimp shells, um, the worms will utilize that and the castings that come out will be fortified and um, help uh, bolster plants' defenses against insects. I have to apologize to my worms that most of my carbon these days is going to be shredded paper because all our cardboard goes towards our hopefully upcoming move. And then I've just got a good healthy feeding. It's got, as you can see, it's got eggshell powder added to it after I pulverized uh, these food scraps. So it's got the grit built right into it. There we go. So these have been previously frozen. You can see there are seeds in it though. So not surprisingly, I sometimes see sprouts in my bins, although usually seeds don't make it through the food processor. That looks like a big chunk of something. Who knows? The worms will tell me what it is. All right, a little bit more carbon on the top. Got this paper towel. Okay, and then I'm going to add some of this beautiful moist vermicompost. Take some of that nice liquidy goodness down into that new carbon and down to the, the shrimp shells were moist going in, but they do need moisture to decompose. There's one of our needles from our pine tree. Look how big they are. When do they hang around? And then what I'm going to do after I just level out this bin a little bit is I'm going to put this waterproof top on again. It's not that dissimilar to just putting bubble wrap on the top, which I also do. But this is just trying to help this newish bin um, make sure that it retains good moisture while undergoing the extremes of the greenhouse. Eventually the worms will come out of the greenhouse and just go into the uh, shady part of our garden. But until that time, they have to be able to withstand a little bit of temperature extreme. All right, everyone, thanks so much for coming along with me and Peekaboo. Just off a little bit extra evaporation. There we go. Bye for now.